Yes, I named my kiln. Don't make fun of me. A lot of us do it. Hello, you dirty potters. How are you today? So today we're going to talk about how to run a manual 181 scut kiln. The reason I'm making this video is because I'm getting a lot of messages on social media as well as in real life of people asking me, hey, how do I run my kiln? And I figure we might as well start with the bisque version of it and we'll do a glaze video later. Now if you're watching this video, you're probably in about one of three positions. Either you just bought your kiln on the low, low price because it was a great deal and someone doesn't need it anymore and now you're like, cool, I can do my own stuff, but I don't know how to run it. The instruction manual didn't come with it, it's kind of old. Or you've been doing ceramic art for a little while and you want to get your hands on a kiln, you really want to control your own artwork. And this is one of the best ways to do it. Running your own kiln allows you to control your own artwork a lot better, make holds, you can start making your own glazes developed specifically to your type of kiln. It's a wonderful and great experience and this thing will be with you for a very long time. But you do have to remember that you do have to learn how to work on it and fix it yourself. Having your own kiln is kind of like having your own car. Yeah, technically you can pay someone a bunch of money to do it for you throughout the years, but it really creates this buying experience in between you and your kiln and you really get to know your kiln inside and out if you learn how to work on it yourself. Luckily, Scut has an entire YouTube channel to where you can learn how to change your own elements, change your own brick, change out certain parts, and it's a wonderful thing. I suggest you go visit their channel. I will put the link down below for you. That being said, if you're the third person who really just got into ceramic artwork and you're a true beginner and you bought yourself a brand new kiln, you might want to wait a little bit. I got a message on my Facebook fan page asking me what the difference is in between bisque and greenware and they just bought a kiln and you're basically buying a car without having a license yet. You should probably hold on a little bit. With that out of the way, let's really get into it. You're gonna need about three different things for the inside of this kiln and a tiny bit of knowledge to run your bisque kiln. Firstly, let me introduce you. This is Ghost. Yes, I named my kiln. Don't make fun of me. A lot of us do it. Ghost here is a manual 181 scut kiln. It's cone six and it's electric. I love you so much. Now this kind of kiln is a little bit old, but that being said, I enjoy manual kilns a little bit better because I can have a little bit more control over my artwork and I have to babysit it for a little while. So if you have a manual kiln, you're going to have to take about four hours out of your day to really do your bisque properly because there is a technique called candling that is suggested for the majority of manual kilns. Kilns with the digital readout on the outside have these numbers that you can program in and it can go up a certain amount of heat per hour or per every two hours. You can program it just like a microwave. You don't need to babysit them as much. You can even program a hold on them if you want, but they're completely automated. It's kind of like an automatic car versus a manual car. Yes, the automatic car does exactly what it does automatically, but the manual car gives me a tiny bit more control, but I do have to put a little bit more work into it. There's a couple things you're going to need in the first place. You're going to need some shelves, you're going to need some stilts, you're going to need some pyrometric bars and or cones, and you're also going to need a sitter. And I'm going to show you what those look like right now. Now my kiln is a cone 6 oxidation kiln, which means on the bar of temperature it can go anything below that but it can't go above it. So for example, if I want to do a bisque and a bisque is at cone 04 or 06, I can go down to that temperature. But I can't go to cone 7 and I can't go to cone 8. I can go to cone 1, I can go to cone 2, I can even go to cone 0, 22. But I can't go above the cone 6 that it's already recommended to go to. Real quick, for anybody who doesn't understand the scale, the scale is kind of like positive and negatives as far as the temperature range goes. Bisque is usually done in between 0, 04 and 0, 06. I prefer the 0, 06 because I am le fancy. But if the 0, 04s and 0, 06s are over here, then the 4s and the 6s are over here. And yes, I understand I just dropped the 0 on you, but they're completely, completely different. There's this very large scale, right? And it starts over here at 0, 022, and it goes all the way up 0, 021, 0, 020, 0, 019, and it keeps going up until it reaches 0, 01, and then it resets at 0, 00. This would be your 0 point on the positive and negative scale if the negatives were over here. After 0, 00, it goes to 1, 2, 3, 4, and that's the positive scale. That being said, when you're doing your bisque, you're most likely going to stay on the negative scale. I've heard of some people doing their stuff at cone 4, cone 5, and then going to cone 6, but the entire point of a bisque is to get all the water out and vetrify it a tiny bit so that it can accept the glaze later on, and then it'll fuse to the body. Inside of my ceramic chemistry books, this is actually called a fusion chamber. They don't call this a kiln at all, because technically you're fusing glaze and mineral and water 
onto a clay body, and that's what makes it the final product. Most people just start at a cone 04, but I started playing around my glazes, and I learned they like it a lot better at cone 06. That's really up to you, but I would suggest you start with one and then test it out and see which ones you like. The first thing you're going to need to run any kiln, not only a manual kiln, is a pyrometric bar or a cone. I enjoy the ones from Orton, and luckily for me, Orton sells these pyrometric bars because I don't really like pyrometric cones because when I mix my cones up with my bars, these are specifically for bisque. So if I ever see a cone shaped one of these, I definitely know that one's for glaze. The first thing you're going to need is a pyrometric bar and or cone. I like to get mine from Orton and I run mine at cone 06. Usually it'll have a stamp somewhere on the side, if you can see it's very very light. It'll say 06, it's right there. These are specifically for my bisque, and the reason I get the bars instead of the cones is because whenever I'm shuffling around all my bars and cones and whatnot, I can know, oh, okay, the bars are clearly bisque, because I don't buy bars that are for glaze, so this must be a bisque one, just to help me separate it out a little bit. Now when you open this package up, now when you open this package up, you're going to see these little tiny bars, and somewhere on those little bars, the thing that says 06, most, if not all, of the bars and cones I've ever bought have the number on them so just in case you lose the package or it gets a little bit scuffed or something that way you can just look at this and it'll totally tell you what temperature it fires up to. You're also going to need some of these stands. These stands right here are the things the shelves sit on and you're going to need these for multiple levels otherwise you would just only fit one level of pottery inside your kiln and that's no good. You're also going to need Le Shelf. Le Shelf is the thing that Le Stilts sit on. Like Le This. So you can Le Do Le Pottery and put Le Pottery on the top. Those are the things that you're going to need before you even start to open this thing up. Okay, we're going to go through this step by step. And I'm going to see if I can give you guys a couple tips and tricks along the way. Some stuff that I like to do just to make sure that my kiln doesn't break or explode or things like that. Yes, my kiln is old and used and I love him a lot. First thing you're going to notice is that I put a shelf on the bottom of my kiln. That's just in case anything explodes down there on the very bottom or some glaze drips down there. I don't have to clean the bottom of my actual kiln. I can simply just take the shelf out and I don't have to ruin the kiln itself. It's like a little protective layer. So let's get started. The first thing you're going to actually do is load the very bottom part of your kiln and then we'll move on from there. Now the cool thing about running a bisque kiln is that you can technically put stuff on top of stuff as well as touch stuff with each other. So if I had a little teacup and I wanted to put it right here just like this, I technically could and as long as I treat it well and babysit it, it would turn out correctly. But I don't want to do that this time. Pottery tip! I could very easily get anything here I want and put it really close to the elements on the side and it would most likely be fine. But what I'm doing right now is I'm centering everything to leave the outer perimeter kind of open because I need to put the pottery stilts there to hold up the shelves. Please don't make the mistake of filling up this entire perimeter only to be like, oh no, where am I going to put the things that hold the shelves up? Because you have to remember that these stilts here have to go out here and out here and out here to hold up the shelf. Right, so if I fill this entire kiln up with a bunch of stuff like this, where am I? Where like where am I gonna end up putting the stilts in order to? Did, I don't have anywhere to put them. So what I like to do is put everything nice and neat right in the middle first, and then expand outwards. I like putting handle mugs in the middle like this because I can make like a little triforce of doom, a little a little quad force. A, I don't know what after four is. That's five. Okay, cool. We loaded the middle of the shelf right here. Now we can fill out the extra perimeter because we've already put down our stilts to hold up the shelf. That means that anything that fits on this outer edge is fair game as long as it's not directly touching a wall. I found a handful of textiles and I'm going to put them wherever I want. I'm not even going to stand those up. I'm just going to lay them down there. After you have your first layer set, do not load your second layer yet. You hold your horses. See that little thing down there? That little thing is connected to a switch. Now before you load the second layer, you need to pay attention to this thing right here. Look at it move. You see this little thing inside your kiln right here? This thing is extremely important. This thing is going to stay upwards while the kiln is on. And as long as it's upwards and it doesn't trigger offwards, your kiln's essentially going to stay on. Now we need to put something in the middle of this right here to make it not go downwards like this. But here's the trick on the outside. The thing on the inside I just showed you is in the relaxed position. It needs to stay like this. This makes it go up, this has it go down. 
Relaxed position, not relaxed position. Relaxed, not relaxed. Clenched butthole, fresh out the dryer. The reason this switch needs to go down is to keep the kiln on. This right here goes up, this pushes down, and that's what holds it in place after you've already turned the kiln on. But well, I, I can't, but like I can't stay here for freaking like 10 hours waiting for a bisque kiln to look just like this. I gotta, I gotta have something hold it in place. Because if it doesn't hold it in place, it lets go and it turns the kiln off and the switch deactivates like this. It sounds and looks exactly like that. The only thing stopping this from being here to turning the kiln off and being here is the pyrometric cone and or bar I showed you earlier. Remember that little switch on the outside I told you about? Makes this thing right here move? Well, the only thing stopping it from going downwards is this little bar that I showed you right here. By the way, I know I didn't say this, but these two switches here should be off. I feel like I shouldn't have to say that, but some people be wondering in the comments below. So here's what you're gonna do to make sure this doesn't go off because you can't stand here and put your finger here for so many hours. Plus this thing's gonna heat up to about over a thousand degrees. So you can't stand here and burn your flesh off. So you're gonna have to put this little pin here or this little pyrometric bar here in the middle of that little twitch on the inside I showed you. I know it's not called a twitch, but the new people gotta have layman's terms. So before you reach the second level of all your stuff, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna put this up. You're gonna put this down and that's gonna hold it there. Then you're gonna take your cone 06 or 04, 05, whatever bisque temperature you prefer to work at, and you're gonna hold this here as you place it on the inside of that. Once this bar is placed right here, stopping the lever from going downwards, this is gonna keep the kiln from turning off until it reaches the proper temperature. Because this bar right here is meant to melt exactly at cone 06. It's a pretty good barometer for what your glaze is supposed to melt at and what your kiln is supposed to actually shut off at. I trust them pretty well. The reason we're using these pyrometric bars and or cones is because these are developed to melt at a very specific temperature. That temperature is cone 06. So without a digital readout, this is kind of my only barometer without a cone sitter for me to actually know what cone 06 is unless I'm like an expert fire watcher or something like that. So once this lever is up and it's set and this is no longer moving down and you have put your pyrometric bar right in there and it's no longer moving down, now you can set your second level of bisque. Pottery tip, if you set your first level of bisque and then your second and you try and get under here, you're gonna have one hell of a time. Just load your first layer, set your kiln like this, and then load your second layer. Otherwise, you're not gonna have complete access to this little trigger right here. Once this first layer is loaded and your parametric cone and or bar is set, and this thing is turned upwards and in the hold position, you are ready to load the second layer. Now that the second shelf is down, do you see what I mean? I don't really have access anymore to that little part there without me accidentally bumping or touching this. So I have to load the first layer, then load the second layer. Dante, you should kill and wash your shelves. Shut up, shut up, Andy. I'll do what I want. Okay, I run out of big shelves because I haven't been to the store in a little bit. I'm just going to leave this space right open. Pottery tip! If you ever wonder how you're going to fit all your stuff in there along with your big shelves, they do actually technically sell half shelves just like this. You can buy these at any store that sells shelves in the first place. Push it to the limit. Limit! That's gonna fall and I shouldn't put it there. Maybe I can get away with some magic stuff here. The limit. Pottery tip! If you have something that's flat like this, okay, guys, it's not what it looks like. If you have something that's really, really rollable like this and you can't really stand it up, you can't really place it downwards without it rolling, you can always put it down like this and put two stilts right next to it just like this. This will keep it from rolling. Push it to the limit. Okay, this is it. I'm done. I'm gonna start turning this on. I'm gonna call this a day. No, it's not as expertly packed as you like to do it at your house with your kiln. Now go ahead and comment down below about how so, so much better at loading your kiln at your house because you're lonely and don't have any friends and you gotta leave mean YouTube comments to total strangers on YouTube. Oh, I'm super lonely and my kids don't call me anymore so now I gotta leave mean comments on YouTube. Ah. Sorry, I got off track. Sorry. Now after you've loaded your kiln and everything's set in there, you're all good. Your little pyrometric bar and or cone is set. What you're gonna do is you're gonna release the bottom and the top. 
of your peak holes. This is so the air can get proper ventilation all throughout as you start to candle and heat up your kiln properly. Candling is really just a process of heating up things slowly to make sure they don't break, burn, or crack or anything like that. Get any S cracks, explode for a matter of fact. I like to do it because one time I didn't do it and I had a horrible experience. But you don't have to, especially if your stuff's been drying for days and days and days and days, and it's like summer and there's no moisture in your clay body. The key component here is to make sure there's no moisture in your clay body so that everything dries and doesn't explode. Okay, after your kiln is expertly loaded and you're expertly plugged in, because sometimes that happens, you're gonna turn your kiln on low. One low, two low. You're gonna make sure that this is still upwards and you're gonna push this button in and you're gonna hold it and you're gonna hear this sound. And you're gonna see that light right there. Once you push it all the way in, slowly let it go. And it should still be on. It is now on low. Now you're gonna take something to prop it open, put it right here. Now I like to candle mine, which means I'm gonna put it on low for two hours, come back, check on it, put it on medium for two hours, come back, check on it, and then put it on high for two hours, and that should melt the pyrometric bar inside there, and this switch will flip downwards, which will turn off the kiln at the proper temperature. So essentially, after you turn it on high, you can let it go, and it'll turn off by itself as long as this goes downwards, which is why it's really, really important to place your pyrometric cone and or bar at the right temperature, at the right place, right in the middle. So because I like to candle my kiln, what I'm going to do at the moment is I'm going to prop it open with this right here. I'm gonna feel it to make sure it's heating up, and it indeed is. And then I'm going to close my kiln like this. These holes are open, the top and the bottom one. I leave this one open just for safety. And this is going to heat up for about two hours. It's about 11 o'clock right now, so I'm going to come back at 1 o'clock, check on it, make sure that switch didn't turn off, look inside, make sure nothing blew up, and then I'm going to put it on medium for about two more hours and do the same thing when I come back and put it on high. Two hours later. Alrighty, we are back now, and it has been about two or three hours. This light should still be on, and this is gonna be pretty hot. You can stick your hand right here just to see how hot it is, but don't stick it too far in. This is also going to be fairly hot. So what you're going to do now is you're going to get something that you can touch this with to open it and check it. Let's use our high-tech sponge here. The whole point of candling my kiln is that water evaporates at a certain temperature, and I want all of the water to evaporate into the air and out of my clay body at that temperature. This is me trying to circulate oxygen so that it burns well, but also introduce enough heat into the chamber so that that water is no longer in my clay body, and nothing explodes when I turn the hit kiln up. I want that water out of the clay body so that when I turn the kiln up, and nothing explodes. This is primarily the point of candling. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put it on medium, we're going to now put this also on medium. I'm going to let this go for about two more hours, and then I'm going to put it on high. When I put it on high, that is going to melt the pyrometric bar on the inside and flip this switch downwards. And it's also going to release this little lever right here. That's what's going to turn the kiln off at the appropriate temperature. Two hours later. So what you should do now is take out the little thing that was aerating your kiln, go ahead and close your kiln, plug up both of the peepholes, and go ahead and put both of your notches on high. The bottom one's on high, and the top one is on high. The kiln is closed, both of the peak holes are closed, it has enough oxygen in it, everything's warmed up to the proper temperature, and we're gonna check on this in the morning and see how it goes. <laughs> Alright guys, it's about 5 a.m. now, and you guys see this right here? This thing used to be like this, right? And now, it's like this. That's because this thing tripped and the pyrometric bar and or cone on the inside melted, which is a very, very good sign. My bisque takes about eight hours to operate, and the glaze takes much longer. My glaze takes like 16 or 17 hours, simply because it's an older kiln and I need new elements. But this right here, regardless, should be from this position to this position, and that's actually what it's gonna look and sound like once it trips. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna wait for the sun to come up in a couple hours, crack this bad boy open, and see if everything came out fine. Tomorrow. Okay, we're good. It should be good now. Aw, oh, yeah, still good. No cracks. Pottery tip. Make sure that you wash your dirty little human hands before you touch bisqueware, because human oils that accumulate on fingertips, or anywhere for that matter, refract any glaze that you might get on your bisque. So if you're taking this straight out the bisque with your dirty chicken hands, and you're about to glaze something, don't be surprised if your glaze crawls. Because you touched your pottery with dirty little chicken hands, you dirty little chicken eater. Now when you take these out, you want to remember to lift them straight up. Don't move them and then lift them. What you want to do is literally just do, do yourself a little bicep curl. Ow, that's hot. Ow, that's hot. Holy crap, that's hot. 
This thing is straight solid all the way through, and if this thing survived, and nothing else here is solid all the way through, most likely we did a really good job at candling, because all the water evaporated out of this before I actually turned it all the way on high. So if this thing survived, the majority of them most likely survived, which is really good. And especially this, because this is the mortar and pestle set that I made, and this mortar and pestle set are both extremely thick and durable. This bowl is probably about 5 pounds. Now it's highly suggested that you wear gloves when you do this, because the majority of this stuff is going to be extremely hot. You guys remember that pyrometric bar that we sat there before? If everything went correctly, it should be bent in this U shape, just like this. This U shape here is what allowed it to trip offwards. So if this does not bend at the proper temperature, your kiln will not shut off. So it's always good to check your kiln in the morning just to see if it shut off and everything's okay. But if you did a good job and you followed this video correctly, it should look just like this. And in fact, I even have a special pot where I put all of my little pyrometric cones. So hopefully one day it'll fill up and I can keep it as kind of a memento. Oh yeah, remember that one time I was like, I'm not even going to stand these up. I'm just going to put these on the shelf as they are and I bet none of them will blow up. None of them blew up. If you were in doubt of me, you, I banish you. I banish you to the Shadow Realm for doubting me. And the Shadow Realm's a bad place too. There's no pottery or attractive females in the Shadow Realm. So, I mean, it's a, it's a horrible place. There's only guys who are way more attractive than you who play, who play Aquaman. <laughs> I'm not insecure. You're insecure. Shut up. Alright guys, well I really hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope it really really helps you, especially if you have a manual 181 scut kiln. If you own a crest kiln, it's essentially the same thing, but you have more control over your stuff. You have like a little bit more knobs, a little bit more temperature knobs. It's a tiny bit more advanced, but it's really basically the same thing. You still need shelves, you still need a pyrometric bar and or cone, and you still need stilts to put the shelves on. You still need all the basic stuff that I just showed you. Well, thank you guys for joining me today. I really, really hope that helps some of you become better artists and run your kiln a little bit better. And please, on the comments below, tell me what you guys name your kilns, because I'm having a debate with a friend of mine right now that says potters don't name their kilns, and I'm, we name our kilns. But thank you guys so much for joining me. If you want to see any of my actual artwork, the Instagram and the Facebook fan page links are down below. You can always check out some of my artwork and message me there. I love your dirty potter faces, and I will see you next week. It's like the condom of my kiln. Like, I know I'm not gonna mess it up, but just, just, just in case, just in case.